Night has fallen and you're weary from travel. Stars fill the sky above, and in front of you is a brightly lit wooden house, the only building you've seen for days. You walk toward the house, hearing the sounds of laughter and talk as you reach the door and push it open. You sit down and join the game. It's a cheap buy-in, and not many of the other players are very good. The lady fiddling with dice gets good cards, but has no real strategy. The man to your right seems to just hold on to the highest cards he has, regardless of suit or any consideration of matches. The man in gray across from you, though, he's good. He already had the largest pile of coins when you bought in, and while your winnings grow quickly, you can't quite catch them. One by one, the other players leave the table, sometimes with peak or with wry humor, leaving their winnings with you or the man in gray. Finally, it's just you and the man in gray. He looks at you, full of humor, and winks. Last hand? He deals, you draw, and look at your hand. It's good. It's great. The best hand, in fact. A royal straight flush. Spades. Aces high. But the man in gray pushes forward his whole pile. You're not sure exactly how much it is, but it's more than you've got. You can't match that. The man in gray stops you. Now, if you like, I'll let you wager your word. I know you'll be good for it. Just promise you'll pay the debt, however I ask. Yep. Ten, Jack, Queen, King, Ace. All spades. The man in gray smiles. All right, then. I'll call. Well, your luck wasn't so good, was it? That's quite the hand, but not for the game we're playing. I'm afraid you owe me. Your life, sure. But more than that, your labor. You see, this land is built on stories. It's one big story, this country, woven of many small ones. Few of the small ones are strictly true, and the big story is mostly a lie. All the stories and songs and myths and legends start somewhere, with a seed. As they're told and retold and passed around, they grow and change to become the stories we know. To pay your debt to me, you'll be carrying stories, finding the seeds first and then spreading them, telling them onwards so they can begin gaining strength. This is no light task. Stories are heavy. Most of the stories you'll find will be small seeds. They might be true, but they'll grow wild and unbelievable with the telling. The more important stories are the true ones. The ones people will tell you about their own lives. Those often get lost in the weaves of the big story. 
The more true stories you can find and tell, the more you can weave that truth into the big story. Tarnish it a bit, perhaps, but isn't a dingy and battered truth better than a shining lie? Now, go ahead. You tell me a story. I'll trade you some information about your task. Your deepest desires? Your greatest wish? Heaven? Big Rock Candy Mountain? El Dorado, the promised land? That place just over the ridge where they all say that the water tastes just like the sweetest wine? Well, I don't know where that is. It's supposed to be somewhere in this country. Ask the people you meet. They're all searching for the same thing. Travel? That's your job. Wander from place to place, gather those stories and spread them. People get bored hearing the same stories over and over. But an old cliché in one state might be a rip-roaring new yarn in another. You sometimes have to make choices about what kind of story you're finding. Is it a love story or a tragedy? Don't gather too many of one kind, though. This grand story needs variety. I'll strip away your flesh to make the journey easier, but still you'll feel pain. Hunger, weariness, thirst and despair. They're all part of stories. The part not often told. And death, yes. But don't worry. As long as your task remains, you come back. It's just luck. Funny how bad luck seems to follow the folks who already have problems aplenty. Well, try your luck out there in this country. See how the dice treat you. It's not all bad. You'll have to work hard, but I'll give you the gift for seeing the true shapes of people. Not many who can do that. Go on your way, seeker. Maybe we'll meet again, or maybe not. Either way, it'll be an experience for you. I'm jealous in some ways. I hope you find what you're looking for. Furniture piled in the front yard, ammunition heaped under the mailbox, and a crowd of clean-cut men ripping apart a car in the driveway. The two heavily armed, mud-caked women leaning over the porch railing share the same bored grin. One shouts at you. Lend a couple innocent gals a cigarette? You are about to hand her a smoke when those men draw pistols and shove you hard into the dirt. You know these girls? They demand. Once they've dumped your bag out into the road, they decide you're harmless. If you were selling booze too, you'd have a lot more cash, sneers one. On the porch behind him, the two bootleggers are fingering their empty rifles grinning in disappointment. I got no can't help but come across this package by the old tree tied to a sturdy stick. 
The cloth wrapping conceals, though not particularly well, something large and softly unsettled. Little eyes blink back at you from inside the bundle. The shape gives a start. Please don't tell my pa that I'm in here. It says in a small voice. Pa doesn't want to live with us anymore. But I want to go with him. Don't tell him, please. I'm hiding. You tell the boy you'll keep his secret. You don't see his father anywhere. You don't see another soul for miles. They don't come every year, you know. The old man is sitting at the edge of a rotting old pier, crooked legs dangling over the water. He watches a pair of seagulls preen and groom each other on a rock just off the shore. Just when the fishing is going to be good. He taps great black, thick globs of spent tobacco out of a huge ceramic pipe. I got another year, I guess. Another year of this town being here, he replies, letting a grin spread across his face. If the seagulls came, that means enough fish to keep it in place. The woman walks the small town square with the poise of Betty Davis. The confident stride and inimitable mannerisms elevating the sidewalk into a plush Hollywood carpet. And wrapped around her neck, a yellow velvet ribbon, bright as an ocean sunrise. You question a well-dressed man parked outside an oyster house. Prudish woman, I took her on a fine date and she didn't remove so much as a ribbon. Excuse me, can you step back from the coop? That's the spirit. You decide to seek a second opinion. You talk with a waitress smoking outside a diner. Something funny about her. Just showed up one day. Doesn't work. Doesn't live anywhere as far as I know. Just around. Myself, I'd love to know who made all her beautiful clothes. You ask the woman if you may join her at a public bench. You may. Lovely outside, isn't it? Her eyes are a beautiful shade of brown. Beneath the yellow ribbon, a thick, fibrous scar wraps around her throat. Weather like this, it reminds me of Paris. You can see storm clouds on the horizon. And you don't relish the thought of being caught wandering this rocky seaside road in the rain. Fortunately, you find the lighthouse door open with a daunting staircase before you. At the top of an ornate wrought iron spiral, you're breathless and feeling the strain on your knees. Rain already batters the walls outside. You can only knock on a heavy wooden door leading into the upper level. Muffled voices and light seep in beneath the door. Looks like we got a visitor. Sounds like a man's voice, deep and rough. Well, behave yourself. I'll open the door. Another man, this one with a higher, more sonorous voice. I always behave myself. He feigns indignation, but his tone betrays affection instead. After a moment, the door unlatches from the inside and opens. The man before you is tall and muscular, with a hint of a paunch beneath his wide chest. The heavy iron knob on the door looks nearly dainty in his huge hand. Didn't want to be out in this rain, did you? Come in. 
Despite the rough exterior, this room looks like a well-appointed parlor. There's a rug on the well-trod wooden floor and an enormously plush couch. And sat upon it is a stocky fellow grinning through a great hazel-colored beard. Tea? He offers, hoisting a teapot. A few years. The tall one sits on the sofa, wrapping his arm casually around the other lighthouse keeper. Five, says the smaller, but by no means small, man. That long? Time flies. We traveled together before that. You must have some good stories from the road, huh? You wake up the next morning on their old sofa, still warm from an excess of tea and cakes. There might have been little cakes. Prodigious snoring rumbles in from the floor above you, and you quietly take your leave. He leans against a fence and turns to face you as you pass him by. At his back is a bag full of bird seed. He assures you that the gawky birds perching on his body are the last remaining passenger pigeons. They look extinct to you? You're not sure those dull gray pigeons look anything like the pictures you've seen of passenger pigeons Though you can't help thinking they stare at you a little too intently. Say, you like birds? They're lovely creatures. Guileless, really. Hunted damn near to extinction, weren't you? He strokes one of his birds under the chin. You think you see drips of blood flecking the creature's dirty gray head. You sense it's about time you start moving on. You be kind to the little birds now, you hear? You hurry along the road, though the flapping of ungainly wings seems to follow you for hours. His clothes are expensive, but unkempt. A tailored jacket stretched and warped out of its best fit by long days on the road. His thinning frame weighs down the boxcar next to yours. You got a light, friend. You offer a match, which bends and nearly snaps as he scratches it against the pitted iron edge of the boxcar. Thanks. He mumbles, perching one last cigarette on his lip. Don't rightly know where I'm going. You notice how deeply wrinkled his clothes are. It's as though a huge hand plucked him from a high society party and crumpled him up like a sheet of paper. Don't rightly know how I got going either. They built a railway just past Missy Hudson's estate. Damned racket ruined our soiree. Might have been a few bottles of Armagnac too many when I walked down the tracks to tell them to keep it quiet. He drags on the cigarette, but you never see him exhale.
dusty truck and a man on horseback pull up next to one another in front of the grocer. Suddenly, the driver and the rider, two wiry old men with identical haircuts, start shrieking at one another. The man with the truck leaps into the street. Brother! He shouts. The one on the horse tumbles out of his saddle. <laughs> Brother! He screams. They embrace in the road. Thirty years! Hollers the driver. The rider, tears streaming down over his face, corrects him. No! Thirty-two! Everyone here is watching these two older men cry and hug one another in the middle of Main Street. Cars and wagons are backing up. People are yelling. Take a photo of us! The driver begs you. Starts hauling a tripod out of the bed of his truck. The long lost brothers pose in front of traffic. Cry snot pouring out of their noses. As angry passerby wave you out of the road, each brother presses a coin into your hand. When the traffic disperses, you realize they overpaid you quite a shocking amount. Low tide on a moonless night. This beach is long, stretching toward a receding sea. In the darkness, the sand seems coarse and gray, alien. The stars are dim and distant. It outshines the stars with its presence, a streak of sickly colored light, leaving a trail of distorted fire. It slowly creeps along the sky like a vast worm, though you know that, given the distance, it must be moving at great speed. Its parabola heads south to north. In the far distance, just for a second, a boardwalk town is engulfed in light. With a rumble, its street lamps and windows dim, then go dark. All that you can see emanating from there is an otherworldly color that you can't quite name. This city is like no other you've been to. Crooked streets splay out in a maze of narrow passages, no two alike. Soon, you find yourself in twilight, utterly lost. Compelled by the cold and foreboding night, you don't question it as you drag your bones into the cab. But you realize immediately how strange the vehicle is. It's a sleek thing, like a shallow parabola gliding over the street. Where to? He asks. You have to stop and think. Eventually, you name Boston Common, the only landmark you know in this town. He peels off silently. You feel the car move before you hear the engine. He takes you through ever-odder streets, flanked by painfully clean, gleaming buildings and signage for businesses you don't recognize. Even the air seems different. It doesn't smell so sharply of gasoline and coal. Eventually, you come to a stop. The fare's in glowing numbers above his dashboard. It's much too high, surely a mistake. No charge, he insists. You look like you need a break. And then you find yourself on the curb at Boston Common under thick moonlight, in a city much as you'd left it before.
Hey there, stranger. You're welcome to enjoy this fire with me, if you're respectful, that is. This here is my spot, and I ain't inclined to share it with any bad characters. You can call me Quinn. These here are my venturing companions. Cass is the big un, and the one with the spots is Flip. I usually beat my way on the rails, but the road news said this town was fat, and the weather was fine. So I'm taking in the sights and seeing what I can drum up. Hey, do you got any really thrilling stories to tell? I'm hankering for one of those. Well, that was something. You spin a good yarn. What's my future look like? I ain't looking for a traveling companion, if that's what you mean. I do fine by myself, so just stick to mine in your own. I'm in the mood for something real funny-like. I'll remember that one. A couple good jokes can get you out of a fix sometimes. Traps and such like. Well, one time in Fort Worth, a feller tried to take Cass and Flip away. Said a kid couldn't look out for him proper like. That they were fat in Fort Worth and they were going to the pound so that he could find him a good home. Well, before I could much argue, Flip bit the hell out of that busybody and Cass and I joined in shortly. I don't think I ever seen a fella so surprised. Guess I ain't going back to Fort Worth no more. Hey, tell me one of those exciting stories. Whoa, quite a story, stranger. Authority? Bosses and such? I ain't nobody's little Angelina, if that's what you're asking. I take care of myself and my dogs. I don't need no jocker looking out for me. So if you're offering, don't. Shoot, I thought I told you to be respectful. Do you want to keep enjoying my spot or not? Think about that. Hey, tell me a funny story. You seem like you still got a sense of humor. What's the use in telling sweet happy tales if in the make you snooze? Well, I don't know a whole lot about the past, but they say there's an engine grave around these parts. Say it's haunted and full up with angry spirits. I used to love hearing stories of cowboys and engines fighting it up. Would swap tales with the youngins. But, well, I suppose if someone shot me, I'd be pretty vengeful too. I want to hear one of them venturing tales. Got any? usually like the scary stuff, but your story needed more punch, I think. Wishes come true, huh? Hmm. If I had to say, it'd be great to have red beans and rice cooked with some fatty bacon. Supposed to be a Mississippi River specialty, but I ain't never had it. Aw, oh, heck. The night's over already. I sure enjoyed talking to you, but I gotta get on. I think I'll see what's happening up the road this way. The tramping life suits me just fine. Every day is a venture. With things being so depressed, folks walk around like it's the end of everything good. But it ain't. Plenty nice things to see if you know where to look. 